I'm the director of it. Oh, sorry about that. My name is Rebecca Fay, and I am the Director of Education at the Delaware Historical Society, located on Market Street in downtown Wilmington. So I just have a couple of announcements before I turn it over to Alex, our digital educator. Um, if you enjoy tonight's program, make sure you save the date for August 5th, when we will continue the conversation with a panel discussion with local elected officials and community members about how we can bring the Wilmington community back together. So there's more information coming soon, so be sure to sign up for our email list or follow us on social media. And as soon as I turn it over to Alex, I will drop some links in the chat so you can do that. Uh, another upcoming event, this is not until October, but we definitely want you to save the date for our History Makers Award. So our Delaware History Makers Award 2021 is honoring Dr. Velma Scantleberry White on Thursday, October 7th, 2021 at 6 p.m. Dr. Scandalberry White is the first African-American woman to specialize in transplant, excuse me, transplant surgery in the United States. She was the Associate Director of the Kidney Transplant Program at Christiana Care from 2008 to 2020 and serves as an advisor to medical organizations and healthcare professionals. Dr. Scandalberry White has been named to both the Best Doctors in America and Top Doctors in America lists multiple times. So again, save that date, Thursday, October 7th. You can join us. I will put a link in the chat um, as soon as I turn it over to Alex where you can find more information about that event. And finally, when the program is over, um, we would really love it if you would fill out the evaluation form to let us know um, how you enjoyed the program, um, how well we're doing and um, give us some suggestions for future programs. So now I'm going to introduce Alex Dittman. Alex is a digital educator with the Delaware Historical Society. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Rebecca, for the introduction. Um, so like Rebecca said, my name is Alex Dittman. So I'll be kind of in the background tonight. And we're gonna get to the questions at the end. So as a reminder, if you joined after I said it, please put your questions in the Q&A section so we can get to those later. So there's gonna be a lot of stuff we're gonna go through tonight. Um, it was great hearing where you're all Zooming from. So I'm currently in Newark, Delaware, and this leads to a perfect time to acknowledge the land that a lot of us are on right now. So I'm gonna, lead, I'm gonna read our land acknowledgement. So we begin by acknowledging with respect, we gather today in Lenape Hawking, traditional homeland of the Lenape people for tens of thousands of years. Sometimes translated original people, the Lenape were known as mediators and called the grandfathers by the entire Algonquian family tree of languages. Encompassing the Delaware River Basin, Lenape Hawking includes present day New Jersey, most of Delaware, the Eastern parts of New York and Pennsylvania. It was home to 20,000 Lenape and three clans. Within the first hundred years of foreign contact, 80% of the Lenape had died from violent conflict and disease. In spite of the famous peace treaty between William Penn and the Lenape chief Tamanand, Europeans forced Lenape westward and northward to Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario. But some Lenape never left, hiding in plain sight as keepers of the land, the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware based in Cheswell, Delaware, the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape tribal nation in Bridgeton, New Jersey, and the Rampo Lenape nation in Mawal, New Jersey, are three of the living Lenape communities today. Let us acknowledge the historical and ongoing presence of the Lenape and the Nanticoke on this land where we now live, work, and celebrate. So tonight we are talking about the way on which the land was impacted by I-95. Our fantastic presenters are going to tell the story of the policy making that led to the current location of I-95 and the people and places impacted along the way. So it's my privilege to introduce them to you before we get started. Dr. Nina David is an associate professor in the Joseph R. Biden School of Public Policy and Administration at the University of Delaware. She has degrees in architecture, environmental science, and urban and regional planning. Dr. David specifically focuses on studying the impacts of governmental policies on the built environment. Her work has been published in the Journal of Planning, Education and Research, Land Use Policy, Planning Practice and Research, and Informatics. She routinely partners with state, local governments, nonprofits, and communities on planning projects and engaged community research. Next up, we have Joshua Solge. He holds a Master of Arts in Urban Affairs and Public Policy from the University of Delaware. His areas of research are focused on urban planning and housing issues. 
Sam Sell is a Wilmington resident and is currently pursuing a master's in public policy and urban affairs at the University of Delaware. His research and professional interests include urban greening policy and the built environment. So you all didn't come here to hear me talk, so we are going to hand it over to our presenters and we hope you enjoy the program. Hi everyone, hope you can hear me okay. Um, my name is Nina David. Uh, thank you, Alex, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you to you all for being here today and spending your Wednesday evening with us. Uh, my students, Josh Solji and Sam So, who are collaborators with me on this project are also here today. And all three of us are really excited to present our research through this program. Um, we have tons of material to get through, so let's get started. Um, if you were to have picked up a newspaper on June 21st, 1957, this is the headline that you would have seen. This is from the Evening Journal. It reads, Adams Jackson Freeway okayed. If you had continued to read, you would have read on that city council action held not binding after July 1st, lame duck body votes 7-5 for alternative line parallel to the old route A, Democrats can reverse decision. If you had picked up the Wilmington Morning News, the headline would have read council okays Adams Jackson Freeway. And again, if you had read on, it would have gone on to say plan adopted by a seven to five vote amid jeering, three Democrats and two Republicans in opposition as filibuster try fails. Now you're seeing all of these headlines because the day before, and that was June 20th, 1957, it was a Thursday evening, the outgoing lame duck majority Republican Wilmington City Council, which essentially had 10 days left in office, had voted on a resolution in favor of the Adams Jackson route or alignment by a very slim majority of seven to five. All three Democrats on council had voted no, and they were joined by two Republicans on council. The city council meeting uh, on that Thursday is described as nothing short of dramatic with most of the 120 members of the public who were present that day jeering in opposition to the decision and the meeting lasting well into the night to about five minutes before midnight. The resolution itself was very, very simple. It essentially said that the Bureau of Public Roads of the federal government had authorized the state of Delaware to construct a freeway and that the state highway department had made extensive engineering studies and surveys and had submitted those surveys and studies to the Wilmington City Council and that the Adams Jackson Street route would give the best and maximum traffic service to citizens of the city of Wilmington and the state. And therefore it should be resolved that the highway 95 should be constructed through the Adams Jackson Street alignment. In addition to passing this resolution, in their last 10 days in office, this outgoing lame duck city council would also enter into a contract with the Delaware State Highway Department for the construction of the 95 along the corridor. Now, some people had believed and perhaps even hoped that the incoming Democratic City Council, which was gonna take office on July 1st, 1957, would be able to rescind the agreement and reverse course. But this 7-5 vote essentially sealed the fate of the Adams-Jackson Corridor that day. And that brings me to our research project. Um, in our project, we ask three very basic questions. Why was this decision made? How was this decision made? Meaning what was that decision-making process? What did that look like? And what was the impact of that decision? And in order to answer those three very fundamental basic questions, we're essentially having to go peel back the layers, look at the Adams-Jackson corridor to document what was there before, the policy decisions that were made to the 95 being, being routed through that corridor and trying to get an understanding of what might have been lost along the way, promised and perhaps even gained. So uh, as we're peeling back the layers, we're looking at the built environment, so the streets, the buildings, the landmark. We're looking at people who lived along the corridor and the neighborhoods around. We're looking at the sense of community, maybe community life in the corridor. 
And we're also looking at all the institutions that might have supported the life in the corridor. So churches, schools, the corner stores, the third places, et cetera. Our methods are a lot of archival research, a lot of content analysis of old plans and policy documents and reports and summaries of public hearings uh, and content analysis of newspaper articles published at that time, uh, assembling lots of images, engaging in some brief photography, and perhaps, perhaps most importantly, uh, interviews with residents who lived in the corridor at that time. Now, this is ongoing work that we're presenting. So uh, at this moment, I would like to also say if there's anybody here in the audience who lived on the Adams Jackson Street corridor, um, and if you have experiences you'd like to share with us, or maybe you know someone else who lived in the corridor, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. My email is there. It's also pretty easy to find me on the Biden School website at the University of Delaware. Uh, we're trying to talk to as many people as possible. So uh, please do reach out and we'd love to hear from you. To answer the sort of first question, the why question, if you will, uh, you almost have to go back to the 1920s. In the 1920s, if you all remember, the automobile enters the landscape by 1925, Ford is manufacturing a ton of cars per day, um, um, a, a car every 10 seconds actually. By 1927, there's about 26 million cars being driven around in our country. And then we head into the depression years. People have lost their jobs. People have lost their homes. There are mortgages in default. The Federal Housing Administration is actually created as a depression era agency. Their goal is to engage in mortgage insurance to stimulate housing, particularly in suburban locations. Home building and road building are actually seen as means to provide employment to people during depression years. As early as the 1920s, you begin to see the sentiment of let's go to cities, clear the congestion, remove the blight, uh, clear the slums, and wouldn't it be great if we could build entire communities outside of cities on greenfield sites and connect everything to inner city areas through highways? You're seeing that as early as the 1920s. But of course we have the depression and then coming out of the depression, we're able to dream. So these are some images from the World's Fair in New York in 1939. And that image of the highways that you guys see to the left of my screen is actually a model that was presented in GM's Futurama exhibit in the World's Fair. People would, would go into the exhibit and you see them in the second picture and they would get strapped onto this conveyor belt and the conveyor belt would move them around the exhibit and what they would see were super blocks and super highways. In other words, in the 30s, we were dreaming about what cities would look like now that the automobile had entered the landscape and that design, the futuristic design that represented progress at that time, very much looked like skyscrapers and highways that would connect people who would live far away from cities to cities, right? So that folks could live in suburban locations, hop in their car, drive really fast to cities to work. Right after the depression, even as, as we're dreaming, we haven't really recovered, but now we're at war. The federal government um, at that time is looking for something to use, right, to give people hope for what our country would look like after the war and housing becomes that dream. And sure enough, the Servicemen's Re Readjustment Act, commonly known as the GI Bill, is passed uh, to uh, provide housing, right, for returning soldiers. Uh, Congress approves money, additional funds for mortgage insurance for suburban single family homes in the 40s. Congress also authorizes money to construct more roads. Uh, in the 1940s, we're also thinking again of slum clearance that proceeds into the 50s. We're now calling it urban renewal. And in the 50s, of course, we have that landmark legislation, the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, which is the context for our presentation today. And that's where the money really came um, for building the 95 through the city of Wilmington. But essentially, I present this to provide the context. Right from the 1920s, you're seeing three key policy actions emerge at the federal level, right? You're seeing suburbanization being subsidized and uh, shown as a priority option. You're seeing investment in roads, highways, interstate roads, defense highways, if you will. And you're also seeing slum clearance and re renewal, urban renewal type policies. And it's really difficult to separate one of these three from the other in terms of the impact that they would have on the urban fabric of cities. Um, as 
especially highways and urban renewal policies in a lot of cities, um, officials would get slum clearance money, right? Renewal money, they'll clear out sections of the city and then they'd get highway money and build a highway through those cleared sections. Um, in the next piece of our presentation, Josh is gonna talk to you about how this planning zeitgeist, the sense of the times, uh, also sort of infiltrated into uh, Wilmington. And you see some of these words, suburban commuters, roads, blight, appear in many of the planning documents that we looked at in Wilmington as well. And that brings us to this planning zeitgeist, zeitgeist context um, in Wilmington. Um, yes, so to give a short answer to that, the question of why you would demolish 25 city blocks through a dense city like Wilmington, um, basically it was the 50s. It was kind of what you were doing at the time. It was a very car centric world and the automobile was gonna be the mode of transportation of the future. Uh, suburban development patterns and single family home construction were at the cutting edge. And um, city life uh, in traditional development patterns had, was really being devalued. And of course, Dr. David mentioned the concepts of urban blight and slums, and there were some dramatic policy interventions that accompanied this. And it was a very anti-density time that saw the um, dense populations of uh, cities like Wilmington and other cities along the East Coast as sort of uh, substandard or incompatible with a good life for people. And um, there was a renewed uh, emphasis on the separation of land uses that um, work life and home life should be geographically separate things. Uh, so there was a big movement to re retrofit historically pedestrian cities. There was a call for massive amounts of new parking to be created, more roads, bigger roads. Um, you know, it was uh, up to the cities to accommodate the suburban motorists and commuters to come to leave the city and come back into it for work or shopping or commerce, even at the expense of the people who still actually lived in the city. And um, I want to read a quote about um, from a news journal editorial about the people being displaced um, for the Jackson Adams corridor construction. Uh, the move offers the fine opportunity to reestablish a new home in a fine new community possibly suburban or even country where children can have healthful play areas and surroundings and the man of the house may raise vegetables, berries and fruits to supplement the family income. They very well may to pay for uh, two, two new cars and a single family home in the suburbs. Um, <clears throat> but this was sort of a dismissive, um, dismissive of the way that people lived in a city like Wilmington. And this idea of this dense urban fabric intermixed with office and retail and even some small industrial um, sites that it was, was not optimal um, and that it should be altered in, in a way to separate those activities. So to quote again, um, a planning study for the residential neighborhoods surrounding the central business area um, and neighborhood two is where the Jackson Adam corridor was located. A substantial part of neighborhood two is devoted to commercial office and industrial uses and the excessive coverage resulting from small lots. This density represents a congestion that is incompatible with healthy living conditions for an economic development, right? So this, um, this dense, mixed use, walkable, um, live work uh, neighborhood pattern was um, considered a problem, not a feature of urban life and a obstruction to economic development um, rather than uh, a component of it. And of course there was never anywhere to park. Um, and then you can't talk about this time period without talking about urban blight. And in Wilmington, uh, that meant a building was aged 50 years or more, uh, or it was a residence with low rent or a building in dilapidated condition or without a private bath facility. Um, and in, if a block had more than 50% of the buildings on it, uh, meeting one or more of these conditions, it was considered to be blighted. Um, in Wilmington, most of that was, uh, most qualifying buildings were um, meeting the age requirement rather than the other two. Mm -hmm. And so the Wilmington Planning Commission really encapsulates this in a series of re report issues um, in the mid 1950s, culminating in a report on justification of FAI 2 through the Jackson Adams Street alignment. Um, Dr. David. <clears throat> um, and this document really lays out the key arguments in favor of routing uh, the alignment through this part of the city. Um, it focuses on the efficiency of the route, the access it'll provide um, both for suburban residents to access the city and city residents to access the suburbs, as well as the um, attractiveness of the proposed highway 
um, with the additional benefits of blight clearance and a division of um, urban neighborhoods. So the efficiency argument was pretty simple. It was the straightest route through the city. And there was a, um, extensive tabulations to show the cost savings to drivers um, that 0.1 mile per trip saved over 20,000 trips per day, 365 days a year, even though the route was the most costly option by far, it would more than pay for itself by 1970, uh, you know, in the argument of the planners at the time. And then the access, um, the high, the, the people that in favor of the route really wanted it to go as close as possible to the central business area so that suburban people could access that part of town to work or they thought they would come into town to shop, see movies, um, that sort of thing as well. And the idea was also to allow city residents access to the suburbs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, another part was that they really believed that the highway would be an attractive thing. By demolishing a block-wide part of the city, um, they would allow, allow um, drivers more room. They wouldn't be within a bounded highway like the designs for the Bancroft Parkway proposal. And um, there was a belief that this wide green barrier would be a properly landscaped highway would be an asset to the neighborhood and that many playgrounds could be put alongside it. It would introduce green space in a neighborhood that lacked it and um, it was, um, you know, sort of the idea that this 300 foot wide entrenchment with an interstate highway at the bottom of it would be uh, more valuable to the property values of the surrounding area than the um, homes and businesses of literally thousands of neighbors. Um, and then there's was the blight clearance, which was, um, if you look in blue, uh, these neighbor, these blocks were at risk of blight and yellow were already considered to be blighted and uh, much of the Jackson Adams corridor met these qualifications probably mostly because of age. Um, and the idea was that, you know, um, not only would you get the benefits of an interstate highway through the city, but you would also um, be able to clear away an undesirable built environment from a part of the town, um, sort of thrown in as a killing two birds with one stone. And then there was the idea of um, dividing neighborhoods. Uh, <clears throat> they, they really wanted to separate the uh, central business area into a, a very work-oriented uh, part of town, and the west west of the highway would be dedicated to neighborhood development. So I'll read a quote from the citywide plan of land use. The central business area of Wilmington now has a population density of 31 persons per gross acre. As stated in part one of a plan of land use, it should be an ultimate goal to eliminate all residential development within this area. Um, the idea was that it would be a line of demarcation between the eastern uh, commercial and industrial part of the city and the Western residential neighborhoods. And so this was a somewhat fraught decision made by the city council. And um, uh, could you go to the next one, Dr. David? <clears throat> and, um, you know, for people living in the Jackson Adams corridor, things might have happened very abruptly for them. Um, the first mention of a need for a highway through Wilmington was in 1948 in a traffic study of the Wilmington metro area. And in 1950, Jackson Adams Corridor was offered as uh, one of four alternatives for Route A uh, of a two-part highway system, the western part being Route A, the eastern being the bypass around the city that is now uh, Interstate 495. Um, so there was the Federal Highway Act, and in 1957, the Federal Bureau of Public Roads approved the Bancroft Parkway alignment. In April and May of uh, that same year, four public hearings were held on the Bancroft Parkway alignment. At this point, everything was going forward uh, according, you know, with the idea of the Bancroft Parkway being the route. But in June 1957, obviously the city council in the meeting to approve the Bancroft Parkway failed it uh, and in the same session approved the Jackson Adams Corridor. And by the end of the month, the mayor, all relevant city departments and the state highway department had signed on to an agreement to route the highway through Jackson Adams. 1957, despite the uh, July, the incoming Democrats voted down the agreement and attempted to withdraw, but were ultimately ignored by the state highway department um, that believed it was binding. So in 1957, they held a single post facto hearing on Jackson Adams. It was composed mostly of residents who would have their homes demolished, shouting at policymakers and city council people. And in 19, November of the 1957, the State Highway Department submitted the change request to the Bureau of Public Roads. At this point, the decision was effectively made. The wheels were in motion. Demolition would start in 1959, despite the fact that resistance to the highway would continue well into its actual construction. 
And so uh, there was a lot of turmoil in city council about this. The decision was re received by outrage by Jackson and Adams residents, although um, the Delaware News Journal really plays down that it was mostly people would have their home seized that they were that were opposed to the highway and that the rest of the city was largely in favor. Um, but it should be noted that the News Journal was uh, very pro interstate at this point. Um, the city council president, Frank O'Bara, who lived two blocks from the Jackson Adams corridor was outraged and despite being a Republican called it the stupidest decision in the city council's history. He was quoted as saying, not only did they condone an improper act, this placed 35 people from their homes and disrupt church planning, but they also took the incoming Democrats off the hook at one and the same time. They made a really hard, politically fraught decision on behalf of Democrats when they could have stuck them with that, with all the political weight of that decision. And so ultimately, despite not having the buy-in of the Wilmington City Council, the highway would go forward um, and most of the protest was largely symbolic, including uh, passing a resolution to throw state highway department notices in the trash. So up to now, you've heard our first two big sec uh, sections of the presentation, if you will, the why, why might we have made this decision in the 50s, and then the next piece of how did this decision making process actually play out, you heard about the turmoil, and in this third section, we're going to talk about the impacts. Um, and to do that, I want to show you a whole series of uh, maps and uh, Josh is going to show you, show you some pictures and show, so is uh, Sam, so you guys get a sense of what this corridor actually looked like pre-95. So that is an aerial photograph that shows the city of Wilmington and if it's hard to pick out the footprint of the 95, that's a good thing. That's what cities look like. That's what the pattern of the built environment urban fabric actually look like. You see the grid pattern. You see the sort of rhythm of the city blocks. They're small blocks, so they're walkable. Uh, they're extremely well connected and cities relied on this intricate connectivity to thrive economically, right? They were walking cities at one point in time. The corridor itself, the Adams-Jackson corridor, ended up being a great mediating corridor between the denser uses on the eastern side and the more moderately dense residential areas on the western side. And now I'm going to show you guys how the corridor um, evolved over about a 50-year period. And the way to read this is to pan on your screen from left to right. And I'm going to go from north to south along the Adams-Jackson corridor. So we're going to start with Shaw Cross, and you're going to see the same corridor repeated three times on your screen, once from 1901, once from 1927, and then the last image that you see, the map that you see, is from 1948-1951. And this is going to show you a bird's eye view, right, of what the footprint of the buildings look like, and, and perhaps even the location of certain landmarks and institutions that used to exist along the Adams-Jackson corridor. So if you look here, um, you see uh, particularly notice the bubbles that I'm going to show you on the screen. Um, you see nothing there, right? Just some empty space. And then by the time you get to 1927, you're seeing garages pop up and those garages stay in 1948, 1951. This is between Shell Cross and Delaware Avenue along the corridor. Um, and that statistic that I'd shown you earlier about how by 1927, we had 26 million cars being driven around in America, you're literally seeing that show up in the Wilmington context in the built environment where garages didn't exist at one point in time. And all of a sudden now you're seeing garages pop up in this neighborhood and in this corridor. Now, if you go further south, right? So if you march southward, now we're between 10th and Delaware Avenue. And um, the first bubble that's going to show up, I hope you're able to see it, 1901, there's nothing remarkable there. By 1927, you have the Parkway Theater in that same spot. By 1948, 51, it's renamed the Ritz Theater, and the Ritz Theater would indeed be torn down. And this is really close to Delaware um, Avenue along Adams. The next big institution that pops up, you don't see it in 1901 but you see it in 1927. This is um, St. Paul's Any Church. This stays in 1951. It would also get torn down, demolished when the highway came through. I believe this church was built in 1911, 
And that's why you're not seeing it in the map from 1901. Next section of the corridor, this is between um, West 10th and West 8th. Um, here again, you're gonna see a whole bunch of empty spaces and you're gonna see those spaces getting taken up by garages, even as the automobile gets more sort of familiar in the landscape. Next, you're gonna see the Willard Hall High School that later became the Willard Hall Grammar School and eventually the Department of Education's administrative offices used to be housed in that structure that would get demolished as well. And this is between 8th and um, 10th along the corridor. Again, if you keep going southward, this is between West 5th and West 7th. Um, you're seeing Zion's Lutheran Church, and this is a fixture over that 50 year period. And then you see another fixture in the corridor, and this is the Diamond State Brewery. In the middle map, which is from 1927, um, you might see if you look really, really hard that the brewery is not in operation. This is because of prohibition, but it would be operational again in the 30s and then it shuttered in the, in the early 50s and it would become a furniture store. It was, it was a furniture store when the highway came through. Next, you see the blocks between West 2nd and um, West 5th. And here you're seeing the Morocco leather factory. This is um, between second and third, close to Conrad Street. By 1927, you're seeing that the Morocco factory has disappeared and some of the structures have been sort of cleared out. And by 1951, Conrad Street has disappeared and uh, all of that empty space there between second and third has been consolidated into a really large playground. Incidentally, today, if you're familiar with the Adam Street courts, the basketball courts, this is exactly where the playground used to exist before the 95 came through. Yet another thing, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but apart from the big bubbles that I'm showing you, the landscape, the urban fabric, the built environment pretty much is um, unchanged. It, it, it's not altered much in the 50 years, right up to the point when the highway would go through this corridor. The next section of the corridor that I'm going to show you as we move further south is between Chestnut and West 2nd. Um, here you're seeing Wilmington Hoysery, that's between um, Lancaster Avenue and Pleasant, and that becomes amalgamated leather by 1927 and um, stays amalgamated leather by 1951. And then the final stretch of the corridor uh, at the southernmost point, you're seeing now between Maryland and Chestnut. And um, this is St. Michael's Church that uh, becomes Palmar Church Hall. Um, and you see the sort of a sense of the Polish community in this area come through. By 1951, it's the Casa Church Hall and this would um, be demolished as well. So what I've um, gone through using a whole bunch of old fire insurance maps and showing how the corridor sort of evolved over a 50 year period, um, uh, you know, sort of gives you the bird's eye view of the built environment. And next, Josh is going to walk you through some of the landmarks and institutions that you might have seen, the footprints of which you might have seen as I showed you the maps, but he's gonna show more images and talk to you more about those landmarks and institutions that were lost. Um, so the first building is going to be St. Paul's Methodist, which <clears throat> I think is just a great example of a big stone church that we see throughout Wilmington. And um, you know, it had two large towers um, that would have stood over the mansion apartments and townhomes that it was nestled within. Um, the, this Paris actually saw the uh, demolition for the interstate as an opportunity to essentially cash out of their building and relocate into the suburbs. And you can uh, still find a St. Paul's Methodist in the North Wilmington suburbs today. Um, ultimately, it met a wrecking ball in 1962. And um, we have the same, lo the same photograph taken uh, October of this year. You can see that properly landscaped uh, freeway in front of us. The next is Zion Lutheran Church. Um, it today stands uh, in an open, it would have stood in the open air next to, I believe, the 8th Street overpass, and um, it met its end as a burnt out ruin. 
This is Sacred Heart Catholic Church. Uh, the church building survives to this day, but 281 of 800 parishioners, more than a third of the parish, lived within the Jackson Adams Corridor and would be displaced um, with a huge blow to the church parish. Next is amalgamated leather. Um, it was founded in 1875 and um, was closed for I-95 construction. To have, uh, part of the facilities were demolished. There was hope that once construction had passed that they would resume operation, but the business never reopened and was ultimately dissolved. My personal favorite is Steckel's Diamond State Brewery. Uh, this is Cam King Gambrinus, the mythical Belgian king who supposedly invented beer. Um, Wilmington was a powerhouse in the early American brewery industry, uh, producing some of uh, most of the beer uh, made in the early United States. Um, Steckel Brewery was the largest in Wilmington and the largest building in the Jackson Adam Corridor by far. Um, it had, was five stories tall with a seven story bell tower that could have been could be seen from throughout the neighborhood. It was founded in 1872 and ultimately shuttered in 1955. One of the things that um, I've read in looking at the history of the brewery was that it um, might have been an obstruction to the Jackson Adams Corridor selection, uh, but we haven't been able to po uh, positively verify that. And of course, the, um, this is a photo of what would have been Steckel Street where the brewery located today. This is the fourth street on ramp um, of the properly landscaped Interstate 95 um, as it exists today. And then there's the Willard Hall School, which as Dr. David mentioned, served as a high school, grammar school, and um, Department of Education offices. It's hard not to imagine a building like this uh, being somewhat of a landmark in the area and probably having a historic designation today. It's a very large, attractive structure, and um, it ended its days uh, with all its windows broken, uh, broken out and as a vandalized ruin. Then there was the Ritz Theater. Um, you know, the idea of a neighborhood movie house was kind of foreign to someone today. And, um, but this was a, you know, a place in the neighborhood where people would go for dates, children would go on the weekends, and um, 75 people attended the last showings. They saw uh, Bobby Darren's Too Late Blues and Frank Sinatra in The Joker is Wild, and it was unceremoniously shuttered the next day and demolished uh, not long after. There's a picture of the demolition. And of course, there were the city streets of Wilmington, which if you ignore the um, look of the cars in these pictures, looks a lot like what other parts of the city still do today. There's, um, you know, rows and rows of townhomes, one after the other, but none quite like the one next to it, mixed in with businesses and offices, pharmacies, churches, um, like you would recognize in the uh, Trolley Square area or Tilton Park in Clear Springs today. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so in our last section, we're going to try to understand who was affected uh, and what they were experiencing during this time. So we've been setting the stage for the freeways march across the city, and we've been looking at it from 30,000 feet, right? Where, as Josh mentioned, many of the justifications presented by highway officials might have made sense. For this last portion, uh, we'll share some of our findings that come from, uh, next slide, uh, demographic reports, social profiles from that time period, newspaper clips and photographs, and interviews with people who live through a very real, unabstracted version of the route that I've drawn here. Many of the following slides will be accompanied by uh, quotes from these people, and we're thankful to these folks for sharing their time and their thoughts. And if any of you are in the room tonight, thank you again for helping us in our research. But just so you get a sense of how long all this took, since the first publication of the route, nine years passed before demolition started, and then another nine years until the project was finished. That's nearly two decades that it took for this highway to become a reality. And this is the time period during which we asked our interviewees to share their experiences. Now, what's not on this timeline is another 1968 date, of course, when the National Guard occupied the city after the race riots. For some of the past residents that we interviewed, these two events, the demolition of the Adams-Jackson Corridor and the riots, bookended a period of great disturbance and unrest. So here we are on Delaware Avenue. This picture taken about 20 years before demolition started. Uh, this is the northern part of the route and you can see the cemetery there on the left, uh, 
all the way downtown on a corner of Rodney Square there. And of course, you are also able to see many of the homes and buildings that would soon be demolished. The white boxes indicate the path of uh, construction. Delaware Ave was and still is, of course, an important thoroughfare. And the box on the right was once home to many of Wilmington's wealthy elite. You can see examples of these mansions on Park Avenue today, outlined in green, but even they are smaller than some of the 10 bedroom homes that were torn down. One resident described it as a who's who of Wilmington and said they would call to get the car brought up. And when they came home, they would call Walker's garage and Walker would come and take their car back. As Dr. David mentioned, automobile ownership was becoming more and more popular. And the people in this part of town had a unique solution to not having their own garages. It was like an urban valet service. Now those buildings fronting the Delaware Ave on the right hand uh, white box there are shown in this picture taken just before construction began uh, in 1959. By that time, many of those large homes had been sold and turned into apartments with businesses on the bottom floor. So while the wealthy had moved out by then, the working class had moved in and made new homes out of these mansions. This occurred in many homes in Wilmington. And one interviewee said that after World War II, they took part of the house and turned it into an efficiency. And the third floor was an apartment. We had the same people live with us, I thought, as our family. All this with one bathroom, by the way. We got creative. So if you look closely at this picture, you can see the Ritz Theater there in the background. And maybe you can make out the Frigidaire retailer on the corner and the optician next door. This density that Josh referred to meant that people could access all sorts of good and goods and services without owning a car. The opportunities to work, live, and play in the city uh, was and continues to be an important draw. One interview, he said, um, for the people who lived in the area who were not wealthy, they had a quality of life you couldn't get anywhere else. So let's take a closer look at the people who lived here and who had a stake in these neighborhoods. So Wellington's population changed uh, over time uh, and reached its peak around 1940 at over 110,000 people. Our time frame, uh, as I've indicated here, is during the 50s and 60s. And what you'll notice is that since the 40s, there's been uh, a downward shift that didn't start or end during our time frame, but did increase rapidly. Just a few important demographic highlights from the census, as well as studies done by the University of Delaware. Wilmington's median household income was $4,608 compared to the US average of 5,956. Nearly 50% of Wilmington residents at the time were born in Delaware. 37% of Wilmington residents in 1963 had moved to their current dwelling within the last three years, but nearly 18% had lived in the same house since uh, 1940. Uh, hopefully this gives you some idea of how mobile and well off Wilmington's population was uh, during this period. Because this was a period of change for many cities across uh, America, um, now what we've looked at is that Wilmington was not alone uh, in losing people to the suburb, but there's an argument for how acutely it was felt in this city, that given factors like Wilmington's size, history, and the particular events that happened in this period, like the freeway, which I've outlined there in orange, these changes were proportionally larger and more impactful uh, than in other cities. So while you're not unique to Wilmington, it's loss of population between 1950 and 60, percentage-wise was the 10th highest rate among 129 major US cities. Now, turning to the map, I know it's not the easiest one to read, but the patterns are denoting if a census area's population increased, as in the clear areas, uh, or how much they decreased or lost in terms of a percentage of their population. So, while the city lost 13.2% of its population overall, a few areas did actually increase in population. The northern, more suburban sections grew for reasons we will get into. You'll notice the darker areas where the greatest losses were ex experienced. The losses in the east side is primarily attributed to the slum clearance project called Poplar A, which accounted for 28% of the overall decline during this period. And the northwestern section was due to a loss of textile company housing in the Bancroft Mills community. And finally, you can see along the orange route, there is a mixed patchwork of population changes ranging from less than 10% loss 
up to a 34% loss. So over the next few slides, we'll look closer at those affected tracts to get a sense of these communities. Now, what we're interested in, but don't quite have yet are the specific demographic identities of those people who were actually displaced uh, and, and had their homes bulldozed. So instead, we're looking at these tracts outlined in purple, which are those directly adjacent to the freeway. As you might be able to see in this map, research as, that research researchers at the time were also interested in changing demographics. And based on this crazy plaid striped map, it really depended on where you were. I know, and I know it's really hard to read, but the gridded areas um, had less than 5% non-white residents. The dotted areas had five to 25%. Vertical lines, 25, 50%, clear, 50 to 75%, and the diagonal hash marks marked areas had over 75% non-white residents. So for the most part, the Western part of the city was majority white and the Eastern parts of the city had much larger percentage non-white residents. For example, track 22, that little polka dotted one uh, in, the, in the middle left, um, which is the West Side Hilltop area, which was directly adjacent to the highway might be indica indicative of some of the forces at play, such as the consequences of initial impact of non-whites upon a principally white area, as well as the possible effects of demolition plans uh, upon population movement. Um, so again, during that 10 year period within just track 22, non-white population increased by over 500 persons, a gain of nearly a thousand percent, White populations decreased by nearly 1,100 persons, a loss of 22%. And by 1960, non-whites con con uh, constituted 13% of the tract population compared to an estimated 1% in 1950. And we see this happening across many of these affected tracts. Here, we can get a picture of how the racial, racial composition of these census areas changed between 1950 and 1963. Tracts that are clear had less than 1% non-white, Dotted was one to 4%, diagonal five to 24%, gridded was 25 to 41%, and solid gray was over 60% non-white. What we can see is that while a few areas like the Northwest, the West Side and the Highlands did not see any significant influx of non-white residents in this time period, the rest of the city, especially those tracks to the east of the freeway, changed to include a greater percentage of non-white residents. It's very hard not to see the freeway as a dividing line that reinforced segregation, but we can also see changes in the Northeast and along the 4th Street corridor on the West side. At this point, we acknowledge there are many other questions about the effects of slum clearance, housing policy, and marketplace practices that contributed to these changes. In the meantime, though, we'll take one last look at the data we have on those tracks adjacent to the freeway. Now, these eight tracks, which I've approximated today's neighborhoods for in that second column, each, popu each experienced population uh, loss, no matter how you look at it, between 1950 and 1963. And what we can see is that cumulatively, the population of the tracks were reduced by 7,591 residents during this period, compared to the reduction of 18,752 in the city's population overall. And on average, they experience greater population loss than tracks citywide. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, of course there was a reduction in population in those tracks. They bulldozed homes, but remember, technically only 926 families were displaced. Now, we don't know exactly how many people that adds up to. You heard an estimate um, from a bar of 3,500, I believe, but it still can't fully account for the losses we're seeing here. We can also see that non-white percentage of these tracks vary considerably. And compared to the average uh, non-white population citywide, these tracks had fewer non-white residents. Finally, we can see that these were firmly middle-class neighborhoods with an average median household median income just slightly above the city's average median income. And as UD researchers observed on the previous slide, the demolition, construction, and the influx of non-white residents may have affected the neighborhoods around the Adams-Jackson quarter much differently than other neighborhoods during that period. And we will continue to explore that area. I thank you for bearing with me through all those numbers. So look, moving on, we're, we're gonna look at some other sources of, of, of information and, and you're welcome. <laughs> now, this may be hard to see in detail, but uh, it's a simple map. 
It's the location of blocks that had their own civic associations in 1965. Each black rectangle represents some indicator of a communal fabric that existed and connected neighbors. And as you can see by the white box, um, which is the uh, construction corridor, by 1965, when demolition and construction was underway, a very clear subsection of these associations had been cut out. And based on many of our interviews, what was lost as a result was a very real sense of connectivity. One interviewee recalls fond memories of what sounded to me like a really fun time. They recalled my parents would give us 29 cents with eight cents for Charlie. We would walk down and go to the movies. It was 10 cents to get into the movie and you could get popcorn and whatever for a quarter. You could do it and you walk there and you walk back. We walked to Celise Dean all the time and the gang started at Brandywine and you picked up people as they came along and we're talking a hundred people by the, by the time we got to Silesianum. Now the resident then added that if this happened today, they would likely be dispersed or arrested. But back then, I have to imagine that each of those blocks with their associations meant that the streets were meant to be played on and occupied by these happy and terrifying hordes of children. Seen here, then are the first homes demolished in Wilmington. In January 1959, began a process that was felt not just by those displaced, but those living in the surrounding neighborhoods. The sounds of jackhammers and blasting traveled far beyond the Adams-Jackson corridor and left uneven swaths of destroyed homes. So how did people make sense of this disturbance? Researchers in 1966 surmised that the extensive population erosion in these areas is due to the undesirability of residential habitation neighboring an area of both planned and actual major construction, future high-speed traffic, and commercial interest in land adjacent freeway interchanges. Another resident uh, uh, recalled that we were maybe a block and a half from where, we, where they were building. It was constant noise six days a week, and you had to turn the television up as high as you can. And so while some stayed and tried to cope, others saw the writing on the wall and left their neighborhoods for quieter pastures. One resident said, it broke my mother's heart. My father also, when they had to sell, their house was not torn down. It's still standing, but we knew that it was built on stone. There was a quarry down the street, so they were going to do blasting. So we moved all the way out to the ninth ward. What we've also been noticing is a disconnect between planning our policy perspective and the lived experience. This map comes from a 1954 report on blight uh, from Wilmington's planning department that Josh mentioned. And this area identified as a blight area is located near the riverfront in today's Browntown and Hedgefield neighborhoods. And as you can see in the legend, and I hope you can make that out. Um, and as we've mentioned before, the definitions of blight were often as simple as buildings being more than 50 years old. So the proposed freeway route is marked on the map in orange directly over what the city has indicated is a blighted area. Conrad Park, as Dr. David mentioned, the top green square there on the map is now the Adams Street Courts and their freeway. And one interesting thing to note is that right before freeway the freeway proposal, Conrad Park was earmarked to get a public pool. Um, now, what we all know as exit six onto Martin Luther King Boulevard was the site of additional demolition later on. And while the green square was supposed to be a park, that plot and the one next to it, which included Mary C.I. Williams School was demolished in 1984 to make way for the Adams Four Shopping Plaza, which is here today, and the McDonald's. What we can do now is take a look at these images taken right before demolition started. We see residential and commercial streets, which today we would be hard pressed to describe as blighted. And we hear as much from our interviewees. They describe growing up in these neighborhoods with great fondness and leave the impression that these streets were well kept, functional, and even beautiful. It was immaculately kept neighborhood with white limestone steps. I can still see the man two houses down pouring Clorox bleach onto his steps. We walked all the time. We were Catholic. We went to St. Paul's Church. We walked to Market Street. We walked to King Street to do your grocery shopping. We walked. But it was nice because everybody was so friendly and so many people were related. There was always someone to visit. Somebody to visit. An important point to mention also is that this area being so close to the riverfront also had lots of industry as well. And as Josh mentioned, there were breweries and leather plants that closed down. And as a result, people often lost both their jobs and their homes at this time. 
these interviewee quotes refer to the closing of the amalgamated leather plant as many of their employees lived and worked in the corridor. The map on the right just shows how prevalent the leather canning industry was in Wilmington, but by the 1960s, we're in a period of decline. And so the tragedy, the irony, is that residents didn't consider their neighborhood to be blighted until the long process of demolition and decay made it so. One interviewee said that then they started purchasing houses, but they couldn't demolish them until they had a certain number of them together. So in the meantime, they would rent the ones they purchased at very low rents. And then they would start knocking down other houses along the block. So you may be missing houses on all four sides of your block and it just became very blighted at the time. The Cedar Hill neighborhood just south of this area, um, which are the current day Hedgeville and Browntown neighborhoods or track 25, 26, and 12, 27 were observed to have these characteristics in 1960. When in every house units in 1960 was in deteriorating or dilapidated condition and demolition plans could have adversely affected housing maintenance patterns. So where the fact that a freeway was coming seems to have changed the way people cared for their neighborhoods. And researchers observed that these conditions prevail in circumstances of reasonably high income levels and extensive home ownership. One factor is reluctance of certain ethnic groups to leave a well-established city neighborhood despite the aging of the housing. And so we see a pattern emerging where people in places so at home in the city are told that they are incompatible, incompatible with the city's future. Another example of this was Zion Lutheran Church. Josh already mentioned this church as an important site for community activities, services, and worship, but sadly, it stood vacated for 18 months after it was purchased by the state, decaying through loitering and vandalism. And one night, a fire burned it down. We don't know if it was accidental or intentional, but we are sure of its effects. My sisters and I had gone to Girl Scouts there, so we watched that fire for hours as it burned. For hours and hours, the cross on top of it burned. And this would not be an isolated event. In all these spaces, once alive with family gatherings, learning, and community, there was physical decay accompanied by the disappearance of its residents. I went to parochial school. And when I started there in first grade in 1956, we had 100 children in our class. When I graduated there eight years later, we had 13 children in our class. And they often left unwillingly. They left angry. The day we moved, my brothers took sledgehammers and axes and kind of took it all out on the house. They just ripped holes in the walls. It's not like somebody was going to move in after us. But my brothers, I don't know whether my dad said, if you have any anger, get it out now. I remember them punching holes in the wall before they left. One past resident remembered the question that was often asked in those days. Are they done building that freeway yet? The personal histories we've heard of people who lived in these changing neighborhoods remind us of the reasons they were given to leave and why they wanted to stay. They remind us that we're still asking this question, but for um, very different reasons. With that, I'll, I'll hand things back to Dr. David. So in the end, our final tally is this. There were 652 dwellings that were taken to make way for the highway. The majority of these dwellings were residential and the majority of the residential dwellings were owner occupied. There were about 50 commercial structures and both Sam and Josh talked about the vibrancy of the neighborhood partly through the sprinkling of commercial structures in the streets. About 926 families were displaced, 48 garages were demolished, two churches, one old school, one private school, one theater. The total assessed value of the property to be taken was almost 4 million, and the number of blocks, full blocks, that were affected was 25. So 95 would leave a distinctive mark. Uh, on the urban fabric of the city, it quite literally you know, cut the city into two and where you had connected streets that were walkable. The highway now is a physical barrier, it's a visual barrier, it's an aesthetic barrier, it's sort of a psychological barrier as well. 
Um, you saw through our presentation that there were mentions of blight and justifications for why the Adams-Jackson corridor would be the right one because there were conditions of blight that were already there or were gonna quickly appear, uh, except that doesn't comport well with other accounts we've read of the neighborhoods here. Uh, what Sam mentioned, um, depicting vibrant city and neighborhood life, was an immaculately kept neighborhood, or even what we read in newspaper articles at that time about neatly kept gardens and houses that were so clean where you could eat off the floor. The promise of the highway was, like Josh mentioned, a lot of landscaping was promised. The block width was about 300 feet, and the idea at that time was that the highway would only take up 100 feet, and you would end up having 100 extra feet of playgrounds and tennis courts and basketball courts and parks along both sides of the freeway. And this would provide much needed recreational spaces for a very high dense neighborhood. And these were some of the renderings and images that were published at that time, both in technical reports and in newspaper articles. And I leave it to you to figure out if that promise was uh, actually delivered. Um, in the end, we see a lot of the conventional wisdom of the time reflected even in the Wilmington and Delaware State Highway Department planning documents. This notion that the highway could be used as a barrier to separate uses, the downtown from the Western residential neighborhoods. The idea that density was a bad thing, old is potentially bad, low rent is potentially bad. And this mix of uses that we like today, the mix of commercial residential uses that allows walkability to also be bad. The highway was also seen as a means to attract suburban residents to the downtown area where downtown could now serve as a regional hub. The idea was to provide a lot of parking downtown for people who would drive from suburban areas to actually be able to park um, close to where they're shopping. The highway was seen as a way to reduce congestion in city streets and the highway was seen to uh, potentially increase property values along the corridor itself and against, you know, uh, along the city as a whole. You also distinctly see the sort of emphasis of cars over people in a lot of the documents we read um, and the sense of here's an opportunity for progress, here's an opportunity for receiving money from the federal government. Someone has to bear that cost of progress and it turns out in the near term the Adams-Jackson route would be more costly to build, it would uh, lead to more destruction of homes, it would lead to more displacement of people, but the justification was made that the cost savings to travelers in terms of mileage traveled and gas costs saved over a 40 year period would make up for that loss of people and property and homes and community. Another thing that was very apparent to us was the lack of any public hearings close to the decision making point on the Adams Jackson route. There were no public hearings held on the route itself prior to that decision coming down. And it sort of reflects uh, the heft of the decision making apparatus at that time um, with the state highway department and other transportation planners, um, you know, talking about the efficiency and effectiveness of this route uh, and, and people who live there, residents and others from the city not being able to provide any input in that process itself. Um, on one hand, we've read accounts about how the main opposition for the Adams-Jackson corridor came from the residents of the corridor who were going to lose their homes. And on the other hand, we've seen that there were tens of thousands of letters submitted to the city from people even after the decision on uh, June 20th, 1957, about how a lot of people in the city opposed the project itself, the construction itself. Um, and we're, you know, this is an ongoing research project, so we're waiting through all of that um, now, and we will be over the next several months. And that brings me to this point again, where if you missed me saying this previously, um, if you lived in the corridor yourself or in the neighborhoods close by, or if you know others who live in that space and who would be willing to talk with us, this is an ongoing project and we would very much be interested in talking to you. And thank you, um, and we're open to questions. Right. Thank you so much. We have a couple questions. We'll just go in a time order. So our first question submitted by John, was the displacement of minorities similar to that in Detroit with I-75 and Dallas and Fort Worth with I-35? If you know anything about those ones. So with, um, with Detroit, uh, I wonder if um, the questioner is talking about the Chrysler Freeway 
and how it went through Par Paradise Valley. Uh, I'm not sure, um, but uh, in Detroit, um, it could have been a significantly minority population that might have been displaced. I know it varied from uh, city to city. With urban renewal, we have uh, some wonderful data from Virginia, uh, researchers in Virginia that actually tracks, you know, the race of those who were displaced. We don't have any sort of big research project that tracks everyone who is displaced by highways of, um, you know, highways around the city. I wish we had that. And like uh, Josh and Sam said, you know, we're still waiting through material. And one of the things we would love to get our hands on is those 926 families and potentially some of the demographic characteristics associated with the folks in Wilmington who were displaced. Thank you. So our next question comes from Sergio. Um, he wants to know, can you comment on clearing the construction area, blighted homes and residences? Was there use of eminent domain buyout or financial restitution? Yeah, so I can start and then both Josh and uh, Sam could potentially continue. Um, I believe that uh, fairly largely the acquisition was right-of-way acquisitions, um, which uh, state transportation agencies uh, routinely use to acquire property through which you want tra transportation corridors or routes to go through. Um, but but uh, Josh and Sam are going to tell you that there's treasure troves of material that are sitting in state archives that we would love to get our hands on. Um, and so Josh and Sam, do you guys want to talk about that? Yes, yeah, so the, um, the payouts um, is, is data, that data does seem to exist, at least as far as we can tell. And um, it is just uh, because of personal information of the various people that were registered for buyouts. It was buyouts, but we don't believe it was eminent domain. Um, <clears throat> but because of the personal information involved, it is considered confidential. So we just are awaiting approval to get into that information. Yeah, and those sort of, um, uh, those transactions sort of the residential transactions didn't often make the news, but we do, but what we do see uh, is a lot of contention when it came to buyouts of, you know, churches and potentially businesses as well, where they couldn't agree on what the right price was. And so we know that there were those sorts of negoti negotiations um, and it sort of echoed a lot of what was happening in the urban renewal projects in Wilmington as well. Whereas you can imagine there was a, a, a lot of controversy, a lot of sort of legal battles that were waged uh, in order to determine um, how these buyouts and how eminent domain would be carried out. So also a question from Bill, would you please discuss any alternate routes for I-95 through Wilmington that may have been considered and why were they not selected? It's a pretty big question. Go ahead, guys. Um, so the primary alternative was the Bancroft Parkway and um, it, it was part of the argument for choosing that route was that it was a, um, it would have been a narrower corridor and it would have consumed a lot of park space um, so it was actually, you know, better to knock down homes than to pay parts of Bancroft Parkway. I love Bancroft Parkway, but I'm not sure I'm on board with that trade-off. And then there was also the suggestion that the, um, like 495 goes around the city. Uh, it was suggested that um, I-95 also go around the city to the west to sort of create a ring around the city. Um, ultimately, there were a lot of interests that wanted the highway to go as close as possible to downtown. And that was the big impetus for Jackson Adams. Yeah, I mean, one of the primary arguments uh, of highway officials was that this was meant to relieve congestion going through Wilmington. So proponents of folks, uh, proponents of the, the Eastern route, um, they were sort of pushed back by saying, well, that wouldn't address uh, traffic headed to in and out of Wilmington. So this way we can combine both both traffic that's going around and that's going directly into Wilmington. Um, so someone had asked where the footprint of the Bancroft route might have been. So I just want to share the, uh, the map. I hope everyone's able to see that. That's where the Bancroft route would have uh, would have been. And the uh, right of way width would have been narrower, I believe, for the Bancroft route. So one of the justifications that was used for the Adams-Jackson route was the right of way is gonna be so much broader, wider here, and that's gonna allow better design opportunities, right? So that's where all the landscaping that was promised that we talked about comes through, where they said, 
you know, uh, the Adams Jackson corridor will allow for more open and park space and better design uh, and better ramps, et cetera, just because of the width of the route. Uh, but the Adams Jackson route was also going to be most definitely the most expensive route of all the routes that were considered, leading to the most amount of destruction of homes um, and the most displacement of people. The Bancroft route, which was um, considered up until the Adams uh, Jackson route was approved, I believe the estimate was loss of about 199 dwellings as opposed to the 652 that were lost because of the approval of the um, Adams Jackson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is probably a good time to mention as well that um, it was not just city dwellers, but, you know, um, folks in the North Wilmington and you know, the suburbs from between Wilmington and the Pennsylvania border. Uh, I mean, they had a bone to pick with this route, too, because they would also um, be losing property and have impacts to their communities as well. So we'll get into the next question from Tracy. It says, do you think that since the federal government was paying 90%, it made the decision makers more willing to pick up the higher cost route than if they had to bear the cost locally? Yeah, I, I you know, don't know. One of the things, um, it's on the wish list, right? I wish this project could have been um, started about 30, 40 years ago where maybe we had the opportunity to interview policymakers who could have, you know, who might have been involved in the decision making process to get a sense of motivations. Um, that's a big sort of black box for us, not being able to say anything about that why piece. Like you can get a sense of it from reading materials and sort of the formally articulated um, responses, right, for why, but that's all a lot of technical reports, not the sort of human personal motivations for why this decision came down um, the way it did. I, I wish I knew that, but, um, you know, there were several federal aid highway acts passed in, the, in our country, um, and uh, the one that was passed in 1956 offered the greatest amount of compensation and spurred a whole amount of, you know, interstate building because of that 90-10, so that can't be discounted um, uh, for sure. But I can't say conclusively one way or the mm -hmm. other. We also had a question from Eileen. Um, first, are you familiar with um, Rochester, New York and the inner loop? So the question pertains to that. No, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Um, just to comment on that, there are a number of um, examples of successful freeway removal projects throughout um, the, both the United States and internationally. Yeah, I think that's that's what our question was about. So that's yeah. good. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking uh, the question comes from all that interest in the cap. Um, and there are some wonderful examples of complete removal um, of the highway, but also caps as parks but to not just limit our thinking to caps as parks, but caps could also contain buildings on them. And uh, Columbus, Ohio, for anyone interested, is a great example of uh, fiberglass buildings, I believe, on top of a cap to mimic uh, more of a Main Street uh, approach, if you will. So the question from Tracy, there's also lots of talk about urban flight, but it sounds like they wanted people to move out of urban areas? When did opinions change wanting people to move back to cities or have they not changed? Josh and Sam, do you guys have any thoughts? Um, so I, I think that there were definitely a lot of pull factors in terms of uh, all of the um, sort of subsidization and incentivization of suburban development at the time. And then you know, obviously the way that um, cities and city residents were being treated by urban renewal and highway projects, you know, absolutely would have been a major push factor. Um, you know, I mean, they just made life worse in the city and, um, you know, would have helped to push people out. As far as when people decided they wanted to start moving back, I'm not sure. I grew up in the suburbs, but have always wanted to live in the city and have uh, lived in the city as long as I could. And I, what, we, what we've come across as far as Wilmington is concerned is this sort of um, fixation on revitalizing the downtown area. You know, there were lots of plans made in the follow-up to their freeway construction 
um, to revitalize Market Street, to bring businesses back in, to build a giant mall so that people would want to spend more time in the, in, in the, in the city. So um, if you're, you know, depending on who you're referring to uh, uh, today, uh, in terms of uh, sort of planning ideas at the time, it did seem like this was just a way to turn over a new leaf uh, and make uh, and reverse uh, a sense of decline, perhaps, um, and, and draw the, the right folks back to the city. It is, questions are pretty lengthy. Do you, have, do you guys see any that you pick out that you want to answer? And can I just add that a lot of demographers are, um, you know, trying to figure out with baby boomers aging and perhaps wanting to move back into the city as empty nesters and now um, generationally Gen Zers and et cetera, others might have housing preferences that are different. And so maybe potentially that could lead to a revitalization of cities um, in terms of housing, right? And housing preferences. But I don't think there's the final word on that uh, yet in terms of how that's gonna pan out. Um, all I can say about um, Jay's question about parks is um, that um, opponents of the Adams-Jackson route did refer to the damage um, done to uh, not just Brandywine, but other parks along the route. Um, but I think obviously it wasn't ultimately enough uh, to change the route, but you're absolutely right. I think the ideas of historic preservation and environmental advocacy certainly aren't what they were uh, today. We're also getting some follow-ups in the chat. So just as a reminder so that we can keep, we, we're getting a lot of really great questions. Um, but as a reminder, so we can keep track, try to put your um, questions in the Q&A. Um, sorry, Alex, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I'm not interrupted at all. Um, just trying to find the questions in some of these. Yeah, so Maggie had asked cost savings for whom, and that's, you know, very directly answered, cost savings for people who would drive. So if the highway was to facilitate um, commuting on part of suburban residents to come into the city, that's who the cost savings would be for, right? Travelers, people who were driving on the freeway because it was the more direct route, like Josh explained. It didn't have that curve around, right? What you would have seen on the Eastern route or on the Western route was straight through. So it was efficiency in terms of route selection and therefore um, savings in terms of gas costs. Sorry, I'm going to chime in real quick. I know there's um, a ton of questions in the Q&A. There was a question on the chat, and I will try to scroll back and find it. But um, the question was, we're talking a lot about the negatives of 95 through the city. So the question was asking if there were any positives or positive effects on the city. That, that was one of the questions we asked interviewees. Um, and uh, the fact is nobody, nobody really had a good answer to that. And, and, and clearly they may be a, a biased subsection of this as a city population. Um, but you know, I, I think you know, at the very least what we can say is that you know, what we are um, experiencing today, the convenience by which we can move through the city. I mean, what is, the, what is Wilmington's uh, current motto right now? In the, is it in the middle of it all? Right, um, that makes sense because it's uh, it's it's part of the thoroughfare, right? Wilmington's right there on 95. Uh, but yeah, as as far as asking those folks uh, who we interviewed, um, they, they I don't think they could see the positive side of it. The really you know nice way to answer that would be to look through all the promises that were made and to see if they actually match up with the data, right? Yeah. Um, did property values go up, for example, 
Um, mm. you know, did it result in cost savings? Did it actually relieve congestion? Did it bring more people to downtown? Did downtown businesses thrive? Um, but it's also, like we said, really tricky. Um, that's why it's hard to answer it because the highway was not the only sort of policy action at that time. You know, you had the depopulation already had begun. You had Newcastle County absorbing a lot of population. It was growing exponentially. Um, and you had uh, urban renewal, which uh, also resulted in some serious population displacement. So it's uh, impossible to point to the highway as sort of the factor. Um, it's probably played a role um, and was one of the contributing factors out of a series of uh, many. So of the people that you, oh, I'm sorry, Alex, no, no, um, of, the, of the people that you've interviewed um, for this research product, project, are any of them still living in the city? Um, there are just a handful. Um, and of the ones that I'm sure of, um, uh, a couple have left quite recently, but yes, yeah, some did stick around. And obviously many of the people that survived today were very young uh, when this was all happening. It was quite a long time ago. Yes. Right. And Sam would say, you know, uh, most of our interviewees were elementary school kids um, when the highway was built. So mm -hmm. uh, part of our motivation is also to, also to preserve those stories because, mm -hmm. you know, sort of time is of essence here for us to sort of, you know, ask people to remember. And I know it's really tricky and hard. It's... Uh, it's not easy to think back to a time when your family was displaced or, um, you know, your home was lost. So we're asking a lot, but, um, you know, uh, we want to want to know what those stories were yeah. um, at a moment in time where we're actually able to capture them. Yeah. Yeah. Jared's question about disinformation is interesting. I mean, like the, uh, the, the timeline, Josh, that, that you went through, I mean, uh, in retrospect, it, it, it seemed like it was a little underhanded to sort of slip in the Adams Jackson uh, proposal right after everybody thought they were there just to debate the Bancroft decision, right? Um, so beyond that, I, I can't say we've come across anything that indicates disinformation or, or dishonesty, but it, it did seem like, you know, the state utilized or leveraged their ability to sort of control the um, the conversation uh, to um, to their advantage. I, I would say I, I don't know if there was any deliberate <laughs> misinformation, right? But there was um, some numbers that might not have been accurate initially. The estimate was somewhere in the three hundred range of how many homes would be lost if the highway were to make its way through the Adams Jackson corridor. But that was a terrible underestimate. And this was actually published in the newspaper. So 360 versus 652 is a sort of a, a giant difference, right? So um, you see some of that, of you know, just the impact that it would have on people, some um, wrong information, but I don't know that I can say, or we can say that it was deliberate um, in any way. Right, and do those renderings that indicate parks and tennis courts, I mean, can, can we call it what it is and see that it hasn't panned out and it was disinformation to some degree. Right, and one of the big pitches was the Bancroft Park um, uh, route would take up more park space from the city and the Adams Jackson route would take only 11 acres and that'll be made up by all this fringe park, you know, parkland that would be, that would be provided along the highway itself. That was a big, that, that, that ended up being a you know, big deal for elected officials who didn't want to lose a lot of park space because of the Bancroft route. I don't know to what extent that promise might have swayed people, right? There's there's no way to tell because um, we don't have the ability to go and ask policymakers, you know, what that, that calculus was when they made the decision. But there was definitely that promise that didn't pan out as we, as we can tell. <laughs> So um, we're going, moving in towards the 7.30 hour. We have about 10 questions left in the Q&A. Um, would you like to answer those or should we ask people to reach out to you? Um, yeah, these are some interesting 
questions that uh, there's mm -hmm. some questions about the DuPont um, company. For those of you who have questions about that, the corporate capital book, um, the Hofker book is fantastic in mm -hmm. laying out some of the politics behind the decision making process. Mm -hmm. So I would point to that as the route, you know, um, that book does a great job of tracking some of the key individuals and some of the behind the scenes process of what went on and who played what role. Um, I would also ask you guys to think about who owned um, the news journal um, at that time. That might be something to think about. And uh, the major newspapers were solidly behind the highway as something that would be an economic boon um, to the city um, and you know that was published there were some columns that were written at that time frankly speaking was one of those um, where you know a great number of opinions were rendered on how the highway would be a plus like a, a, a positive net positive net gain for the city so those are some things that I would uh, I would point to Um, there was one comment on um, the uh, Blue Rock. I'm s assuming like that Delaware Blue Granite um, obstructing some of the park development that you, they talked about. And um, so we have an engineering report from well before construction. And so they knew where all the bedrock was. So if that was an impediment, um, you know, they knew of it when they were making those promises. We still have 79 people hanging in, um, waiting to hear some answers to some questions. So um, Marilyn's asking, was the 95 plan just for individual drivers or for truck traffic as well? Uh, both, I mean, it, it was you know, gonna be a major thoroughfare. Um, they were looking and um, thoroughfare and also um, connecting to through the Philadelphia area and connecting people to the Delaware Memorial Bridge. Um, so it was, I, I think for both, really. I mean. All right, and then the question of how did the construction of ninety five affect? And I think you covered this in the um, in in your presentation. Affect racially segregated areas or racially segregated neighborhoods? Sam, do you want to take this one? Sure. Yeah, um, that's something we're really trying to hone in on. Um, as you saw in the presentation, we've uh, made some approximations so far by looking at the tracks sort of directly adjacent to the freeway, but our, our future research will be sort of uh, trying to understand those displaced um, specifically um, and continuing to find um, sort of archival data on um, what life was like uh, in those most effective tracks. And um, kind of as a follow up to that, Rachel is asking if there, you're going to be working on a part two of your research um, that covers the environmental, geographic, cultural, and economic ramifications over the decades since, and especially on people of color. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so to that, I'm gonna say there's some wonderful research coming out, um, not necessarily focused on Wilmington, but uh, linking highways and urban renewal efforts to things like urban heat island effects and stuff like that. And um, to do a project like that well, we would have to use very good science and craft a research project with probably funding. Um, so we can write like a large funded research project that can actually look at that. So ours is mostly uh, looking backwards in some way, looking back and trying to document um, what has, you know, what the major changes in the built environment and loss of community have been um, in terms of environmental impacts or public health impacts. Um, you know, there's research that documents that really well in terms of impacts on asthma or heat island effects or stormwater and stuff like that. And we're hoping to piggyback our work onto work that's already been done so far in those areas. Great, thanks. Um, so let's see, Cassandra asks if there is any economic data that might quantify whether or not this route actually contributed to the development or deterioration of downtown Wilmington. 
Um, so there was a University of Delaware economic study done in the 70s that um, looked at the economic impacts of Interstate 95. And actually what it found is that outside of the city of Wilmington, it, 95 was this enormous wealth generator for um, the rest of Newcastle County, um, property values and employment, you know, was great economically. And then once that area, that corridor through Wilmington was economically devastated following the construction of the highway. And uh, to add to Josh's thought there, um, in the 50s and 60s, we sort of assumed that if government went in and cleared land, the private sector would jump in and redevelop that land and build all those malls and commercial areas. But in a lot of cities, that never happened. Even with urban renewal projects, you know, we'd use federal monies, we'd go in and clear out entire blocks and those blocks would just sit there. Because that private interest that we thought was there that would come in and redevelop so that that economic activity that we thought would happen could happen, never really did. So um, there's often a 10 to 15 year lag in terms of when a lot of the blocks in many cities across the country were cleared and when they ended up being redeveloped. So that's a real tricky one to track. So our next question from Lynn is, would you argue that the current route seriously inhibited Williams Wilmington's economic development or were even greater forces more impactful? Yeah, I would just say piggybacking of what um, Dr. David and Josh just said, you know, the, um, the urban renewal projects that happen near downtown Wilmington are also kind of still unfinished projects and, and did not fulfill those promises. So um, I think, right, in combination with what's already been said, um, that I guess what it is safe to say is that that use and influx of federal money certainly did not have sort of those promised effects. Um, for Wilmington, at, at least economically speaking. Yeah, I think everything was against urban life and cities at this point, um, and that the highway was a large piece, but just one of a very large um, sort of anti-city movement in planning at the time, sometimes inadvertent, sometimes very intentional. And you, you, know, you can go back to planning's roots in zoning. Zoning was built on the separation of uses, this idea that residential and industrial and commercial uses are not compatible altogether. And that permeates all the way from the early 1900s to you know, the culmination point in the 50s and 60s, where all of a sudden money was available, right? To um, you know, put governmental you know, might behind some of those ideas of separating people and decongesting cities. Mm -hmm. And you see that play out. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, and I apologize because as I was monitoring the chat, I'm not sure if this was covered, but someone had asked, and, and I think I might try to take this one a little bit. <laughs> um, what plans are there to repair the damage done to the divided communities resulting from the original construction? Um, and I, I just wanted to kind of give a shout out to um, the Delaware Historical Society's part two of this conversation. Um, save the date for August 5th. We will have community members, elected officials. Dr. David will be there again. Um, and we're gonna be discussing um, exactly that subject <laughs> on August 5th. Um, I don't know, uh, Sam, Josh, and Dr. David, if you wanna you know, mention a few things, maybe to, as a little teasers, but um, feel free. Yeah, and um, I can add that the sort of conversation about reconnecting communities is not just happening in Wilmington, across the country. Uh, last I checked, there are at least 33 odd capping projects that are under discussion. Um, and so uh, this is just, you know, seems to be the right moment uh, for Wilmington to be talking about reconnecting uh, parts of the city that were, um, you know, divided by the highway going through the Adams Jackson corridor. But it's not just Wilmington, you're seeing that conversation play out in many other places across, across the country. Yeah. Mm. <sighs> I think we already might have touched on this a little bit. Um, Rachel and Snow, did the parks ever exist even for a moment or was it the whole idea kind of nixed when the highway was completed? Well, the landscape um, boundary does, does exist. I just think that the people that made this decision or that were making this argument had never physically stood next to when operating interstate highway. Um, you know, I 
ride my bike and have walked my dog through that area, it's not a pleasant thing being next to I-95. So the idea that it was going to be an asset to the neighborhood, I think, was misguided. So our last question is from Lynn. Um, as urban planning experts, and with the benefit of hindsight, which route would each of you have chosen? 495. <laughs> Sam, what about you? Uh, yeah, if I, if I had to pick, yes. Yeah, same here. And I would have uh, uh, hoped to have retained the interurban rail lines that were once magnificent in our country <laughs> and uh, tried to invest in transit as opposed to roads. And if we had to have it, I'll go with uh, Josh and Sam. <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely had to have it. Maybe yeah. <laughs> if we didn't, then maybe transit. <laughs> And, and I'll also say um, there was a lot of argument against um, a westward bypass. And, um, you know, today, some of the Western alternatives um, would have looked a lot like 141, which we had today, which may have been a better way to move a mass amount of cars uh, through the around the Wilmington area um, and left more of that denser part of the city intact. All right, so uh, Dave commented that the state of Delaware is beginning a feasibility study to create a cap over I-95, and that is one of the topics that we will be discussing in our panel discussion um, on August 5th. Um, oh, so it looks like, yeah, no, okay, we're just getting some comments here. Uh, Marie says, yes, 495. Um, when they built that later, I thought, yeah, now you figured it out, but the damage is already done, all right. <laughs> Um, if I can just add to that, actually, um, 495 was always going to happen. Um, and so part of why they wanted the second freeway was that it was sort of a buy one, get one free, that um, if you're going to have one, if they're definitely building 495, why not get a second one paid for um, in addition? Because it was FAI 1, 2, and 3. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, just I just want to thank you, Dr. David and Josh and Sam for joining us tonight and, and being patient. We had a lot of questions. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the presentation. Remember to save the date for August 5th. I'm also going to put in the chat again uh, the evaluation form and Zoom will probably send you a link to that as well. Please let us know how we're doing. Please let us know what you liked about the program, um, what you didn't like, hopefully everything you liked. <laughs> um, and we're looking forward to seeing you on August 5th. So thank you for attending and have a great night.